The African American legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, and education. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they had been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and joining us on today's program is the Dean of the Congressional Delegation from New York State, the Honorable Charles B. Rangel of the 15th Congressional District in Harlem. Hi, Charlie. Good to be here. I finally got a spot on this popular this show. This is a popular I've show. I've been watching it. <laughs> uh, you recently visited Africa with President and Mrs. Clinton, and that was a symbolic thing for the President of the United States to go to Africa. Tell us a little about the trip. Where did you go? Who did you meet? And what do you think we accomplished? I preceded that trip. The president asked me to take a 40-person trip uh, to several countries in southern Africa, and I did so in December. Uh, of those countries, the president and Mrs. Clinton revisited them. And so we went to the Republic of South Africa, Botswana, Uganda. Uh, 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 we were on the um, Gori Island with uh, Senegal and, of course, Ghana. Uh, I am telling you, when the president asked me at the conclusion of the trip uh, just what was the most memorable part, I had to share with him that never in my life have I seen millions of beautiful black folks mm -hmm. assemble in such a dramatic way mm -hmm. And to hear the drum beats and the music that I went to Africa as a good American, but I came back as a stronger American because I knew that I was not a minority. Mm -hmm. And the president asked me, what did I mean by it? And I said, well, everybody in this country has some story, some tale, some country, some continent, some history, some music, some culture that they identify as an American with. And those of us that have the African roots with the history just torn from the pages, that when you see that, there is something about being a majority. There is something about being not a minority, and there is such a pride and mm -hmm. excitement about it. And when you, when you travel with the president, it just comes out like a third-dimension movie, and you're in every scene. It, 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 I've been to Africa many, many times. I've never seen anything like that in my life. Well, I think the president was trying to send a message. I think the message was that America, at last, recognizes the economic power of the African continent. Is, is that the direction that you think he was headed? That's a part of it. Uh, the most important thing, he wanted to shatter the negative image okay. that mm -hmm. the world, and especially our country, has about a dark continent, a continent of famine, a, a continent of, of, of civil war and strife and pain and misery and the little black kid with the swollen belly with flies around his mouth, a place that investors would not be inclined to mm -hmm. look at as investors. Even on the trip, I was shocked to hear white people say how different the Africans looked in the different countries, you know, as though Europe, you know, or the different languages or the different cultures. And, and you would be surprised how many Americans think of Africa as a country. Mm -hmm. And the history has been denied us, but it's been denied our country. We are basically a European country. Mm -hmm. Everything we've followed has been that way. So the president, in meeting with presidents of, of economies that uh, were growing from 5 to 12 percent, uh, seeing American investment returning 30 percent, uh, not just seeing the, the heartbreaks in Africa, but seeing the governments in, in, in Botswana, the diamond mines and the, and the technicians. And I tell you something that's so exciting, especially for an educator like you, uh, and I haven't said this before, but seeing you reminds me, in every country, 
I could see leaders who are old timers surrounded by young, mm. talented technicians. Mm. The pride that you, it was almost as though they knew that the torch for the next mm. century will be these young people. And they have strived to enjoy democracy and open economies. And the president wanted to encourage investment in these countries and to meet with the presidents of these countries and the ministers, and he has done a fantastic job. In one sense, African relations between the United States and Africa was a victim of the Cold War. We were trying to get those who were on our side, many times supporting dictators, as against those who were the communist sector. Cold War is over now. The economic war, the global economic war is on now, whether it's in Asia, Africa, Latin America. To what extent do the leaders of the African nations recognize that, in a sense, they're in a catbird seat in terms of economic development on that continent? They know it, and that's the reason why uh, 40 uh, of the ambassadors from the sub-Saharan countries have endorsed my African Growth and Opportunity Bill. And they, too, are anxious to shatter the negative image that the world has painted of Africa, not just in the United States. And they are so candid in their approach to dealing with America, and no one says it more eloquently than President Mandela in saying that his freedom probably would not have occurred if it was not for the leadership of the United States of America. But all of Africa knows on the question of colonialism, America was on the wrong side. But he says, and this is amazing because I pray to God that I could find that much compassion, that Africa hasn't got time to look in the past as to who committed the wrong, who are their friends now, and how can we go forward. And so, if you see where America has been, you know, we never recognize Central America and Mexico, but we need these new markets. Europe has closed off her markets with a, uh, a European common market and a common currency. Uh, we see what's happening in Asia, where it's hard now to penetrate the market and the economies are shaky. We've already done what we've had to do with South America. And you see this big, majestic, rich, wealthy continent with hundreds of millions of people here. Mm -hmm. And the only thing, in my opinion, is history and racism that has kept us from treating them as partners with mutual respect. We have uh, exploited them, but we have not built them up in terms of what we've done in Europe with a Marshall Plan. And so in the bill, not only does it encourage investment and remove barriers for trade, but also sets aside monies for equity and investment and infrastructure. And I tell you, as much as we want to talk about what we should do for Africa, when you see the opportunity there is for American mm -hmm. investors, the road in Uganda, they got Coca-Cola, wrestling with Pepsi-Cola, both of whom are building uh, bottling companies and plants there. You say, do they know they were in the driver's seat? Mm -hmm. The question, who's going to build the most roads, mm -hmm. which they need to distribute? Who's going to purify the most water, which they need for the drink? Who's going to pay the highest price for sugar? <laughs> and they're competing right there in Uganda. And that can reoccur all over Africa. You know, you mentioned something earlier about racism in Africa. He also mentioned something about heritage. Uh, when we grew up, uh, we knew about J.R. Rogers and the African kings and so on, but we really didn't understand the depth and the beauty of the culture of our people. And the black history movement and the black studies movement has helped to bring that about. Now that African Americans are beginning to see this, 
I think that white people are beginning to see it. I think they're beginning to understand that many of the uh, algebraic and geometric theorems came from Africa. They, uh, many of our artisans came from Africa. In the sports world, any sport that an African gets into, they get to be great. And now they're seeing this political genius. They're seeing the Gandhi of the 1990s. They're seeing Nelson Mandela the man with the greatest amount of compassion and understanding that yeah, I can right. ever hear, <laughs> coming forth and, and talking about the world. So the question I want to ask you is a tough one. To what extent are these folks beginning to be by these folks, I mean the Europeans, America, somewhat colorblind in dealing? Are they dealing not with white, black, but maybe with green? Maybe they're beginning to identify more along those uh, forms of communication? Well, the president kind of opened up the door for scientists and educators to explore when in Ghana he said, on this continent was the beginning of mankind mm -hmm. as we know it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that kind of shatters the veil of racism that people have mm -hmm. to let them know that no matter how badly they fight it, that scientists have said we all came from this continent. I do believe that economic competition surpasses racism in the marketplace. But tragically, every place I've been, as I vicariously enjoy the, the political freedom, I haven't seen that much change in the economic powers mm -hmm of these countries. Indeed, in South Africa, when you deal with the smaller Southern African countries, they have been economically oppressed by the powers of the white economic machine in the more powerful South Africa. All of them now enjoy African American leadership, but that white economic machine is still subsidizing mm -hmm. and cutting off competition to the smaller countries who now are coming together and trying to see whether they can join their economies to be more competitive because some of those countries, with all of the pride of being a sovereign, cannot afford individually to do all of the things mm -hmm. that larger countries can right. do. Mm -hmm. And it's great to see the different languages and cultures of the people coming together and saying, we're still sovereign, but let us unite in terms of our representations, our councils abroad, and economically, let us try to be a viable force for competition. And, and it's just wonderful to be alive at this time, to see a whole continent coming to life economically, as it already has achieved relatively politically in independence. Well, they've got political independence, but one of the problems in many of the African nations has been the hegemony that certain groups of people, certain tribes, certain individuals, certain families uh, exercise over the nation. I know that they, right now they're talking about sanctioned African Americans have suggested that uh, Nigeria be sanctioned because of the oppression of various folks there. Uh, as you were over there, did you observe if sort of a movement for more freedom, more of a so-called de democratic type of uh, operating the government, or are we still in a quasi-military control situation? You've asked one of the most difficult questions, and I'm going to try to be brief. You may recall when President Clinton was standing next to President Mandela at a press conference, how everything seemed like they yeah. were just raised together, a father and son, mm -hmm. they were hugging each other. And in the course of that conference, someone asked the president about the trade bill, President Mandela. And President Mandela went off on something, the Helms Burton, you don't yeah. pick their friends. And uh, many people thought he was talking about our trade bill, but he wasn't. The first thing he was talking about is that, that America could be arrogant enough to give sanctions against any company that's doing business with Cuba. And he made it clear that he had friends before the United States, which include Castro. But directly in connection with the, uh, the ability of South Africa uh, to understand uh, the powers of the other countries, 
it's amazing to see how uh, even outside of the agreements that we have with them, how they are coming forward with all types of trade missions uh, uh, that are there in order to invite people and encourage people uh, to really invest uh, in those countries. And uh, uh, it's going to be really uh, a wonderful thing to be able to see when we find the democracies flourishing because the countries find not that it's the American thing to do, but because they find that in terms of investments and improving the quality of life of the people is the right thing to do. You mentioned Nigeria. My bill received a lot of criticism from some people who said that there were conditions in my bill and that conditionality is something we don't ask of other countries, so why do we ask it of Africa? Those so-called conditions were progress toward democracy, mm -hmm. open markets, and respect for human rights. Mm -hmm. Those were not American terms. The ambassadors representing the smaller sub-Saharan countries, they put it in their thinking that this would sell the bill to Republicans and conservatives. Many of the African leaders have said, and it's a beautiful thing, is that you don't have to put that language in a bill for us. Democracy is what we want to do, not because America wants us to do it. And if the president is only going to say in the bill that he's going to deal with those countries, how do we deal with Nigeria? How do we deal with other countries mm -hmm. that may not have the same form of democracy mm -hmm. that we have? It made so much sense, I had to tell them, hey, we don't need that mm -hmm. language. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't meant <clears throat> to be offensive. It was really meant to say that you have achieved those standards in which mutual respect and open trading can exist. And they would say, well, we know that it can't exist with these other countries. So if we know it and you know it, why do you have to write it? And it made sense. Nigeria is tearing the State Department apart, the Congressional Black Caucus and the Congress, and for the first time, we're sending Ambassador Pickering over there for the first time in a long time to see whether or not any resolve to the standoff can be achieved. But there's such strong forces on both sides of the issue as it relates with Nigeria. Respect for human rights on one side. Why should a black dictator be treated any differently than a white racist when it comes to murder and, and people being incarcerated without a trial. And then on the other hand, how can you take an economic engine that so many smaller African countries are dependent on, and we are in terms of civil strife in many of the neighboring countries, and squeeze her economically and at the same time be one of your primary source of imports of oil, which is so hypocritical and inconsistent. And so it is a problem that you could have this show go on for many, many weeks with the debate. And uh, it's so easy to be sensitive and sympathetic to either side. See, you're a congressman. <clears throat> You've been in Congress for, what, 26 years? That's Reverend Butts. He <laughs> seems like he's got a running count going on. <laughs> uh, and the last discussion points up the uh, nuances that are involved in any discussion about legislation and, and action. Uh, one of those nuances comes up in terms of what are we going to do with this budget surplus. Some people want to pay off the debt, some people want to lower the taxes, some people want to shore up Social Security, some people want to build a human infrastructure, education and housing and job opportunities. Where do you come down on this? Where I come down is that uh, with this so-called surplus, not everybody in America is enjoying the uh, richness of this surplus. And even though people talk about crime going down and unemployment non-existence, if you go to the poor communities, white and black, you'll see in Appalachia and the Harlem's around the community that crime is up, drugs is up, people are still going to jail, and people are still poor. It would seem to me, whether we're talking about the federal government or the city or state, 
that now is the time when you have this unexpected increase in revenues to invest in our educational system to make people strong enough, to be productive enough, to keep the competition keen enough so that all of America can move forward. We have a million and a half people locked up in jails. Not only does this not make any sense from a human standpoint, but from an economic standpoint, it costs hundreds of billions of dollars to maintain this system. We find in every state capital, the competition is for getting a prison in their hometown like we used to do with military bases, but not for education, not for universities. They're not fighting for it. And so it would just seem to me that whether it's Mayor Giuliani, instead of talking about how mean-spirited he can be in determining where remedial treatment should be, that if you found people that come from communities that have not been as productive per capita, anxious to improve those skills, that you should be providing incentives because you would know there is a relationship between lack of skills, unemployment, drug use and crime. The relationship is there. And you go and check out the prison population and you will find the overwhelming majority of them are unemployable and untrained. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about investment, the president has said skillfully that it should be in the social security system. Well, that makes a lot of sense in politics because you and I know that uh, with the bumper crop of kids that are going to go into retirement, and the way the system is that we pay the pensions today out of revenues we get today, when that bumper crop gets here, it could be that each individual working will be carrying a retiree on the back. So that makes sense. But the president also is advocating an educational program. And I think that the Democrats are going to take back the House because of the resistance of the Republicans in saying that what we should have are vouchers or we should have allowed people to have individual savings accounts. Well, God, you know, that is not the dream that America gave the immigrants. Mm -hmm. You know, no matter how poor or dumb they were, they had hope and dreams for their kids, and you know that. And it was the public school system that they could depend on. And so, as far as I'm concerned, the president's 100% correct in saying that we get the tobacco tax, and we know that 300,000 kids are becoming addicted to tobacco. We take the surplus, attach that to Social Security. We move in and not only deal with higher education, but from the time a kid starts thinking and that mind starts going, cultivate that, and in the long run, it'll pay off. Of course, he wants to make certain that health care is there. In this Congress, we are not going to see any of those things happen. I wish I could be more positive. But well, the Republican you... majority mm -hmm. have decided that it's better to do nothing and hope that the people are indifferent and to get reelected than to engage in any meaningful legislation. There's a certain amount of <clears throat> political opportunism, but there's a certain amount of mean-spiritedness and lack of reality. The country is moving into haves and have-nots. The old days when you could drop out of high school and get a job in the garment industry is still gone. This country, in my opinion, cannot stand an underclass of 20 to 25 percent. That's where the crime comes. That's where the cost comes. Uh, what can you do to convince some of your good Republicans and some Democrats that investment today in education and opportunity is going to save this country from destroying itself, which it can if it you becomes it. a two-class society. I've been pretty effective. I'm the senior Democrat on Ways and Means. We handle trade, taxes, and that type of thing. And so I can command the attention of the, of the uh, multinational corporation CEOs. And they're spending tens of billions of dollars training and retraining those who have survived the system. And I've been trying to convince them just how much money they would be saving and how much more productive the workforce would be if they started lobbying and getting involved when the kid is born from elementary school to college and to become more partners with them 
In times of war and national security, we can always expect for them to have a flag up there with E for excellent. The country now needs people to be concerned, not just with mandatory sentences and how long you can keep somebody in jail, but for patriotism, for national security, we should have our business people providing the lead. And to a large extent, I am talking to the United States Chamber of Congress. I got them involved in all of our bills. Whenever asked a question in front of Ways and Means, they're the first to admit that this is an economic chain around our neck, locking up people. But another group of people that are remarkably silent are the church people and the religious people and the spiritual people. Uh, I am just amazed. You know, I, I often try to have an analogy in saying, what would you and I be doing if we were in Africa and we saw these white folks snatching these black folks and throwing them there? We would have said, what are we got to do about it? How can we stop it? Or if we were in the South and witnessed the Klan and the lynchings, and we would say, uh, in our imagination, we would try to organize and try. Well, we, we, we can't do anything about it. But what will we be saying if history writes mm -hmm. that America youth was being pulled mm -hmm. off of the streets mm -hmm. and locked up, being exposed to drugs, and that we had a mayor uh, that was going after anyone of color, whether you're a cab driver, whether you're a vendor, whether you're a kid going to school, and he emphasizes that eliminating crime is the issue, and we had a governor doing the same thing, and we had uh, Gingrich down there doing the same thing, so that it's a pattern, it's not uh, just a regional thing. And, and you would think that it's hard to find out where Jesus Christ was in the church during the Klan because they snatched the Bible and ran with it. But, you know, when you take a look at the atrocities that have been committed against humankind, the strongest and the most courageous voices have not been the church. And I think now where you're dealing with human life and people being locked up, a million and a half people, is not exactly a holocaust, but these people are living misery every day. They're not productive. They return to society, and, it, and, and it's increasing. I think it's very clear that you and some of your colleagues and some folks in our community recognize that we have a challenge, a challenge of year 2000, 2050, and uh, on behalf of uh, our community in New York City, I want to say we appreciate you, Congressman Charles B. Rangel, whom we've been talking with today, uh, and a legend, African-American legend, and we're talking about the challenges that face this great country and how Congressman Rangel and the rest of us are going to meet those challenges. Thanks, Charlie. Good to be with you, Roscoe.